Welcome to M Talks from M House. Meet the innovators in the Web3 and NFT space. We're still early, but there's no time to waste. Let's get started. Today we have a true innovator, Dutch artist Dadara. Now, after completing his studies, Dadara started to design flyers, record covers, and live paintings for the then upcoming international electronic house music scene. Uh, this included work for the Roxy Club in Amsterdam, Outland Records, uh, the Mysteryland Festival. His underground exposure led to public recognition, and his paintings became noticed by the Reflex Modern Art Gallery in Amsterdam. Until today, he has held 10 solo exhi exhibitions, as well as exhibitions in Paris, Berlin, Stuttgart, Miami, and New York City. So on that note, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to very innovative Dutch artist, Dadara. Welcome, Dadara. Hey. Well, I, I think you found the text still in like an old text because I mean, those 10 exhibitions by now, uh, there have been way more. Give us the bio from your perspective. Give us the, uh, oh, the 2022 the bio. I, after the dance music scene, I uh, started like Burning Man became kind of my new thing. I started building really big installations. I got also obsessed by destroying my own work, blowing it up with explosives burning, uh, smashing it to pieces. And uh, then, and I think that's actually what's pretty interesting when we look at NFTs. I started my own bank as an artist. Like 10 years ago, government didn't have money for artists, but I had like billions to bail out uh, banks. So I felt like, hey, if there's no money for the arts, I start my own bank. And that was a project looking at value. And uh, I don't know, there's like looking at value has been for many years a thread throughout my work and also looking at reality and physical versus digital reality. Again, at Burning Man, like I think eight years, nine years ago, I built a big golden like. It was like 50 feet high and we worshipped. We had a kind of religion, like for real, we guided people on their spiritual path to enlightenment. And uh, like four or five years ago, I did another project, Solid Mission where I also looked at reality. I was locked up inside a big black box at Burning Man for the entire week. No daylight, there was artificial light inside and people could come in and tell me how everything outside looked. And I would depict that on the walls and create like a virtual reality based on what other people would tell me. And I don't know, so reality and value are two important, like especially in the past 10 years, that's what I've been focused on a lot. So I think in a way, uh, I mean, going into NFTs was like the logical next step. When did you start or how did you start or did you start with art or did you start somewhere else? I uh, I don't know. There was, yeah, it's a, he's, he's mainly known in the Netherlands, but I, there was a poet, a uh, writer, Jules Dilder. And I know when I was like 17, 18, uh, he had his 50th birthday, but he didn't celebrate his 50th birthday, but his 50th year of being an artist. And I think that kind of answers your question. It's not something I have become. It's something I've always been. And But basically, I think around the age of 14, 15, I was making always like black and white drawings. And one day, I around that age, I still have to have that. I'm sure I can find it somewhere. I have a paper. And I started designing like kind of and thinking about my artist name and that's when I came up with the name Dadara. So that I have had that name since I was 14, 15. Um, it, it comes from, uh, yeah, obviously it also refers to Dada. And what's very interesting that now we're almost 40 years later. And uh, in a way, Dada, I realized, has been a very important, again, thread throughout my career um, because it's, that what Dada did was doing kind of ridiculous stuff, stuff that looked like outrageous, clownesque, maybe, but it all had a very serious background. And um, like three years ago, a Dutch newspaper wrote an article about a book I released, and they said Dadara, the dead serious clown. And um, yeah, I so saw to me looking back, uh, it's very interesting that uh, I realized when I was 14, 15 that. Something in me um, would be a Dadaist forever. And 
I think when I look at the stuff that was important throughout my life, like punk, like Burning Man, Burning Man comes from prankster culture, and it's all it's all very much linked to data. And I, even now in um, like what I'm doing with NFTs, I think there is an element of that as well in all in almost everything I do. Obviously, we we know each other. Um, a- we live in uh, Amsterdam and we have some mutual friends and I saw you mention something about this recently so did you go to art school and uh, how was that experience I never went to art school in Amsterdam I but I went to a lot of art schools and uh, in a way I think I I didn't do that consciously but in hindsight I guess I designed my own education by uh, getting kicked out of art schools by leaving art schools I went yeah, I went to a few different ones, but also at the same time, I have always been uh, also creating my own art and also having exhibitions, doing projects, uh, being published. So also during my kind of a little bit strange school career, I for a while, I lived in Austria and I was making drawings actually for a kind of, it was even before the internet existed, it was something that was called Muppet Video Text. And I made drawings and it was a kind of system that could, people could get a terminal, kind of small computer, and then log into that system. And I also stayed a lot in Italy. And I was, I'm like really fortunate that I've always been able to live off my work. Because so like when I was 18, an Italian magazine, they started publishing my drawings. And back then there were still Lira. So sometimes I would like be a millionaire. I would get... So I think, again, look, I'm now thinking it's interesting looking at crypto, but sometimes I would just look at my bank account and I would get like a million lira in one month. And I went like, wow, I'm like 18 and I'm a millionaire. Um, yeah, and but it's, I don't know, one of the most important moments or pivotal moments uh, from art school was when I was 18. And this was already my third education and I had to, come to the principal's uh, office or the the director of the school. I don't remember anymore. And he told me like, look, you'll have to leave school immediately. Immediately, We're kicking you out of school. Two reasons. One reason, you have absolutely no visual talent. Second reason, you also have absolutely no creative talent. And I mean, you know, when you're 18 and this is your dream and people tell you that, you're like, oh, shit. And then he told me like, yeah, you know, maybe you could consider becoming an accountant and i looked at him like what the fuck and then he said like no no we don't know if you have any talent for accountancy but at least it's not visual and it's not creative and uh, again in hindsight i think it's actually uh, that that was a very important moment because it taught me to and this sounds maybe negative to not give a fuck about the opinion of others but it's it means that everybody has an opinion, and especially if you're an artist and you're a little bit known, then people will have opinions about your work, which is which is okay. And their opinions can be really valid and if they look from their point of view. But it's, I think, very important as an artist to realize it's their opinion. So everybody can have an opinion about your work. And, and that's, in a way, also the beauty of art, that it's not, it's not something objective. One person can think it's brilliant, what you do in, as an artist, and the other person can think it's, like, the worst ever. But it's important, I think, very important if you're an artist to realize the opinion of others is, I mean, it's, like, a little bit important. But most important is that you know what you're doing and you're true, being true to yourself. It was a lead-in question because I knew the answer, um, and and that's that's what I was, uh, you know, obviously hoping to get to. But it's it's very interesting because I think at eighteen years of age, still a teenager, could have had many different effects on you, or could have different effects on people in general. Um, yeah, so you know, well done to your to your principal for um, totally putting you down and trying to like end your career, which is turned out extremely successful um but you know i think uh, yeah indeed for artists and for people in general really important to not really give a fuck and remember that everybody's opinion is valid but it's just one person's opinion and i think you know even 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 within the world of accountants you know people suffer from imposter syndrome in, in all walks of life uh artists i think are particularly in the public eye, so so even more so. But I think a lot of people do, and I think it's a, it's a good lesson and a good takeaway to 
not oh, to listen to people, but not not don't listen too much. <laughs> but also, especially nowadays, because I mean, with yeah, with Twitter, with Instagram, with yep. all the social media, everything you do or say instantly may provoke a reaction, and people can tell you like, "Hey, we don't like it," or it's even nowadays like I post a piece of art, and then I got like hundreds of likes, and then. A few days later, I post something else, and hardly anybody likes it. And but that's okay. But I I'm afraid that sometimes people will go like, "Hey, maybe this is not good because people did not like it." Or I guess, and that's where I think it's so important that when you're an artist, you you know why you're doing it. You know that it's true to your soul, and then you also realize that when you put it out in the real world or real world, mm -hmm. that yeah, it will get reactions, and that's okay. But they should not. I mean, they can impact you and they, they can make you think, but that should not make you not do it. Take us through your early works and how that evolved to your current works. We're going to dive in, in a bit more detail into some of the projects you're doing now, but just, just a quick evolution of how things started and, and, and where they went in terms of your artistic uh, output. Well, I think they started, as you already mentioned, in the in the dance scene. Actually, before the dance scene, as I said, when I was 14, 15, I made all these kind of simple black and white drawings with a clear idea behind it. And uh, that was also the Italian magazine, Linus. They started publishing them. And then, uh, beginning of the 90s, there was this whole new movement, or end of, already end of the 80s, the house music. And I, when I was 12, I had, above my bed, I had all these record covers hanging. Like the, the one iconic one was the Banana by Andy Warhol for the Velvet Underground. And I always kind of, it was always my dream to make record covers. And then something horrible happened. The CD came along and I saw like the CD and I went like, damn, there goes my chance to make record covers. I think I was like 16 when they started uh, becoming big. And uh, but then house music came along, and I, uh, I mean, it moved me. I was going out a lot. There was this whole scene of people, and I felt really connected. But when I looked at the imagery, I saw all these kind of photocopied shitty flyers with some fantasy images, and I, I had all these books about like '60s music culture and all these psychedelic posters and amazing art, and also with punk. I mean, there was a certain aesthetic. If you can call it aesthetic, but I mean, it it really uh, the imagery I think was very important, and yeah. all it was part of the music. It's the same like with graffiti and hip hop, and a house came along, and nothing. Uh, I mean, it didn't touch me. And then I thought, I mean, in hindsight again, right time, right moment, also. And uh, but I felt like, hey, uh, and I guess when you're 20, you feel pretty confident that you can do everything. I went like, hey. I'll be the I'll be the person making imagery for house music, and I went to a record company, Outland Records, and I said like, "Hey, can't I uh, do something for you and make let's make a spectacular flyer?" And uh, yeah, and they said yes. And this was even you know it's now difficult to imagine, but this is before social media and everything. But I made that one flyer. And I think like a few months later, I uh, I would be doing live paintings in Tokyo, in Miami, New York, Istanbul, Paris. It went like, it really was this, because I think everywhere people were doing parties and there was this new underground movement and everybody was, even before the internet, there was, I always believe also there's a kind of global consciousness or there is something happening. And as an artist, we somehow have antennae that we can uh, tap into it. And it was the same there. It was like right time, right moment, where I picked something uh, up. Yeah, and that was the that was the start. And then, uh, I don't know, for a few years, it was kind of cool, you know, when you're 22, 23, that you're, like, as DJs, you're flown in uh, and you're in uh, expensive hotels and you feel a little bit like a rock star. There's limousines picking you up. Uh, I had also really long hair and colored dreads and big hats. And I don't know, after a while, I... I felt it was time to move on, and um, yeah, uh, uh, I was always painting. I made paintings. I started going into sculptures. I also, yeah, I'm thinking. I don't know if you can see there in the corner. There is like there. There's a head of a baby. That's a loudspeaker. 
Um, that's one. Uh, actually, I don't know if this you see there. Yes, I see. But, uh, I made that for B and W in uh, England. Uh, so I also I slowly started going into more three dimensional. Reminds uh, me a bit of the London Police uh, style, also. Yeah, uh, I uh, I know they're friends of mine. We also collaborated. Yeah. yeah. And um, where was I going? Okay, so I went. What I think started happening that my the initial black and white drawings they developed into paintings, then three dimensional, and I started more and more creating my own uh, my own world. And then after, I mean, obviously everything didn't, looking back, everything seems logical. But then uh, I started going to Burning Man and uh, that's the place where I also, uh, I started performing and uh, I don't know this, everything became, uh, there was installation, sculpture, performance. I also made a movie, eventually also made a theater play. But I think after a lot of years of doing all these projects, the last few years, again, my focus went back to painting because painting and drawing is that's, yeah, your first love never dies. I mean, that's, that really is a big love always has been. And I love to use different mediums to work in. But uh, I also realized at a certain point that doing all these big projects, kind of my painting was suffering, which is, wasn't suffering at that moment. It was really good that I did it. But now, uh, in the past few years, it's not a conscious decision, but I realized, okay, I've done these projects at Burning Man. I've done a bunch of stuff. and I. Uh, but then I don't know. And then NFTs came along, which is also interesting because a year ago, I was definitely not planning to do that. But that's, that's what always happens in my life. Something comes along. It can be like this underground house music. It can be Burning Man. It can be... It's almost like there are two people inside of me. So I I make the decision like, no, I'm going to paint or I'm going to do this. And then suddenly one morning, this other me goes like, hey, I've got a great idea. And then the other me goes like, oh, shit, I'm fucked because now I have to start doing that. Sounds a bit like me. Um, I mean, I you know, I'm not necessarily an artist, but uh, yeah, I, I know that feeling. <laughs> I'm like, oops, here we go. Um, no, so really interesting points you brought up there. Uh, I'd like to see you with dreads. Uh, that's one. Uh, that's not going to happen, I guess. But maybe, maybe sometime we'll see some photographs. Um, the other one that you were talking about, you know, the house music, um, the the that that you know, cultural revolution that happened there and how you were at the forefront of that i think that's super interesting because you know at um at, you know at, at m house we we believe i've been into crypto for quite a few years i think it's a revolution in how people store and transact um store value transact with each other in a peer-to-peer -peer way an absolute game changer and a revolution and it took a while to catch on mainstream. And I think something that I did not see coming, and quite frankly, I don't think many people saw coming, was that NFTs would be the gateway drug to crypto for so many people. And, and it's a really interesting idea that you have this revolution in terms of how people can interact with each other. Um, yet it al almost seemed like it needed the artists or the cultural angle to give it that catalyst, that 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 spark to, to really kick it off into the global consciousness. I mean, what, what are your what are your thoughts around that? I didn't see it coming like a few years ago. Actually, I started becoming a bit upset with tech because that's also it was my like for real project because I saw yeah, I saw all the Instagrams and Facebooks. And what I saw is that it became increasingly difficult for artists to make a living and increasingly easy to gain exposure and get likes. Yeah. And um, I was always used yeah, to the fact that if someone would use my art, then I would get paid for it. But now there's this huge platform and everybody uploads their art and they're, yeah, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg is a billionaire and with Spotify, it's uh, again, the CEOs, they're all billionaires and artists are complaining more and more that they can't earn money. So, um, the first time I heard about it, I I already felt like, hey, this this might in the future become a possible new distribution platform. And I think for what uh, what I hear and read for music, it's already like also becoming that that it it this might be the new way to release music in the future. 
And um, but then again, what I what I mean, I'm a re yeah, I'm kind of I don't believe in being emotional or rational. It's for me, uh, uh, your mind and your heart are two sides of the same coin. But I kind of I I feel something, and I just got excited because I felt a lot of like with the start of the house music, like when Burning Man more than 20 years ago when I went there. You feel there's a lot of excitement. There's also yeah. stuff going on that a lot of people, including me, don't. You don't really understand it all, but you feel it's happening. And then I go like, "Hey, the the fact that I still don't understand it, but I also realize it's still people that say they understand everything. I think they're lying because I mean it still can't be understood because it's not yet defined. And I realize that that's the moment when something is." It was the same with house music. Once it got big, I mean, I I left. It wasn't that interesting anymore. But it was interesting when it was all in development and nobody knew where it was going. And it's the same with um, NFTs because I think like, uh, yeah, probably like a year and a half ago or something like end 2020, a really good friend of mine from Philadelphia, Scott, he started telling me about NFTs and he sent me a link and I saw a, a website and I saw examples of images that were sold for a lot of money, but they all looked kind of, to be honest, crap. And I went like, Hey, there's okay. There's like crappy art being sold for a lot of money. I'm not interested. But then he actually started talking to me and he said like, no, this is actually, you should realize there's, there's a lot of interesting thoughts and indeed the possibility of becoming a new distribution platform. And then uh, first, I, I was looking for other people to help me get into NFTs. And I think after a few months, like in March or April, I went like, hey, why don't I just try it myself? But what would I want to add to that space? And there was a drawing of mine um, with uh, what the fuck. There's like a Venn diagram with what the fuck and in the middle, what the fuck. Very simple. But a few years before that, it went viral. And uh, what happened is that everywhere this drawing started popping up, but also people were remixing it, people, and quickly my name was removed. It became a kind of meme. But at a certain point, I also got upset, like, hey, everybody is using my idea. And uh, But then I felt like, hey, what, you know, WTF NFT, I just made a what, what the fuck NFT, wrote a what the fuck NFT manifesto. Because I really I think as an artist, I also feel it's important to give some background to your work or it's not only about the image. And it was, I think it was just a tryout. And uh, I, I really love, I, I love learning by doing. So I just felt like, hey, I do it. Yeah. And I, I didn't realize that it's January 2022 and I'm doing it more than ever. It could have been That's like awesome. one off. But... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, is there, I don't know, is there any other way to learn other than doing, I'm not sure, particularly when you're in these times of great change, which I think crypto, blockchain, Web3, NFTs, uh, and that's, I think, what you're describing earlier is when you feel like the house music scene, you feel this energy, not everybody understands exactly what's going on, but you know that there, that change is coming, you know, that change is coming yeah. to how we used to do things. That it's coming, and that's exciting. And I think that's the time that people like you, uh, people like me, certainly, uh, and I certainly hope many of the people uh, looking and listening to this, um, you know, get excited and, and get involved. So that's that's very interesting. And I, we're definitely at that point now. Uh, I mean, you know, thinking back, there there was a point when we were uh, all quite excited about Web two. There was a point at which we were all quite you know, interested uh, about, you know, Facebook. It's like, wow, oh, we can connect with friends around the world. You can message and you can do this, you can do that. But Go ahead. Thing when it's new, I, I still remember because I had a website, my first website in 1994. Uh, and we did, a, we did a party to like, you know, release the website uh, with DJs and everything. I mean, uh, and then people would go like, oh, it's so cool. You have a website. Yeah. And they would go like, how can I get on there? And I said, you have to do like, you know, HTTP, uh, double slash, www. And people would say like, wait, we do four Ws? And I went like, no, no, you have to do three Ws and then dot. So it was just yeah. weird. And uh, But but also now as NFT, it's not that I, I don't believe it's like sacred or it's heaven or it, it's just a new development. And what I again noticed that 
with internet, with everything, I think this is hugely interesting, but it's still the real world. So it, in a way, it mimics the real world. Also, there is like great stuff happening. There is stupid stuff happening. Um, but I mean, one thing is sure, there's a lot happening. Definitely. And we're definitely in that period now where, you know, interesting you talk about the website address. We're in that period of just terrible user experience. But, you know, where the, where the people who feel there's something happening go and seek that out and go through those these awful experiences to get a wallet to connect to things. Um, soon it'll be much more developed. It'll be homogenous. It'll be a little bit boring. Uh, we're in that really fun and exciting period uh, right now. Um, it's good. So, it's good that you realize that I think it's very important for people involved in NFTs and Web3 and everything to realize that the user experience for, as they say, normies in normie land yep. is really horrible. Because when I made that first W, you know, the, the what the fuck NFT, so obviously I knew no one in NFT space and cryptos, but I have like an old school following, people that like my art. So I posted it in my mailing and a lot of people were like, oh, this is cool. You've got an NFT and we like that you're experimenting. We want to get it. And then people for days, they tried to bid and I mean, and, and they lost money and they couldn't swap this. And then I realized, hey, it's just still so, and I mean, this is like eight months ago and, uh, you know, so it's, it already got way easier, but still, uh, I mean, it's still early, which is exciting, but also means, uh, yeah. But that's that's why we're here, I guess. You know, it's the wild west. It's it's the fun times, and when it becomes homogenous and dull and boring, and everybody can do it, uh, some of the some of the fun will will have worn off, and maybe we'll look for the next thing, look for Web four, whatever that will be at that point. But for now, um, but I think you know we still also are in a, a nice period where we can shape um how it develops you said you have to learn by doing and i totally agree um particularly in crypto and particularly in web3 there's no way to learn apart from just jumping in and you know buying some crypto and buying some nfts and just accept that you may not like them or things might go wrong you just have to do it um so apart from that what would be your advice to artists um, or indeed collectors, but I guess particularly from an artist perspective, who are looking to start with NFTs right now um, and are unsure what to do, maybe have started, maybe haven't. Uh, what, what would be your advice apart from just jump in? One thing I did was go on Twitter. I actually had a Twitter account, which I, I didn't even know the name anymore. I had to look for it. So I started a Twitter account, never used it. And then, uh, I mean, people told me you need to be on Twitter. So, and uh, it's not only that it's like your network and uh, that people will get to know about you or doing, but for me, it was a huge learning tool. And also, I mean, just realizing it, it really is this other world. And yeah, they consider people who are not in NFTs normies. They use all kind of slang and, uh, you know, the hodl walk me uh, uh, GM. It's just like all these abbreviations. That's, uh, but also already realizing when I was on Twitter that, yeah, there is something philosophically hugely interesting. And that's that it about it's about digital ownership. So people understand uh, that, you know, you physically can own something. But when we migrate our lives to the digital domain, as I er said earlier, I mean, the digital domain mimics, it is the real world. So it has um, the same kind of uh, issues as the same kind of, yeah, like ownership. People also want to own stuff there. It helped me realize that. And um, I think just reading a lot, what people finding out links. And um, I think at a certain moment when you go on Twitter, you just initially start following people and then, you make it into something personal because you can eventually find what, and I think as an artist, everybody has their own way of working. So I think what you should do is just, I mean, just start somewhere and then really start thinking like, don't just go like, hey, I'm now going into NFTs. And no, you're still the artist who you are. So that's always the core. As I said earlier, I mean, the opinion of others, it's not, it's not what you want to do. And what you want to do, see NFTs as a new tool but then also start following people that you feel connected with, that you go like, hey, they're doing something 
that feels like the direction I want to go in. And then you might actually see what tools they are using, what website are they on foundation? Are they on OpenSea? Are they on Super Rare? Uh, is it possible to be conceptual? Can you be a painter on NFTs? Can and I think Twitter will already answer a lot of your. I mean, it will provide yeah. way more questions than answers, but it will answer some of those uh, questions you have. So I think that is a very important advice. I think that's uh, that's great advice. Uh, you know, it's something you know maybe I forget sometimes, but Twitter is the place to be for crypto, and it's the place to be for for NFTs. Um, in fact, people on Twitter refer to the platform as CT. They don't refer to it as Twitter. They refer to it as crypto Twitter. You know, yeah. say, here on crypto Twitter. So we don't we don't even consider it part of the general Twitter platform. We consider that we're in this 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 particular corner. Where we, where we exist in a, in a, in a crypto bubble, um, which is but true. On, but On Instagram, I mean, Instagram works really well for me, but I noticed it yeah. worked really well for my physical art and installations and performances. Because so it's, and I don't believe in people on Twitter, you'll see them often saying like, hey, Instagram, everything else is dead. But again, what I believe with NFTs and what we have seen in, the, in a long time, every time something new comes along, it's not that the new is going to replace the old, it feels like every time there's just new layers being added to our reality and life is just becoming more and more complicated. It's not yeah. like that we have this and then something new comes along, this goes away, and then we have this. Yeah. Now we have this, we have that, we have this, and then we get derivatives and yeah. everything starts mingling and we get lost. Indeed. But you know, Twitter is a great place to interact with and learn about crypto and about NFTs. Uh, for sure. And then Discord has gone from being the gamers hangout uh, to being where um, NFT communities are are organized uh, around different projects, around different people as well. So uh, I think uh, Twitter, Discord, definitely good places to go. Um, uh, and something else that you just touched on there as well, and it's something that I've heard you say in person before, um, is that, you know, it's not about our NFTs good, bad, cool, not cool, are they art, not art? And, and I think I've, you, you can probably put this more eloquently, but I've heard you talk about this before and you said it's just a medium, you know, that nobody's ever come up to you and said, oh, this is a, this is an amazing, and, and talked about the type of canvas you used or the particular type of oil paints you used. They just said that this is a great concept. And, and I think you've spoken about NFTs just being another uh, medium to, to communicate your message, right? Yeah, because that's where, yeah, I know people in the NFT community, they're now upset because Wikipedia uh, said that NFTs are not art. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> yeah, in a way, I go, and it might be controversial, I go like, yeah, NFTs are not, NFTs can be anything. I mean, yeah. you can, I think in the future, you can sell your house and somebody will get an NFT as like proof of ownership. Yeah, and that's not art, but, uh, and, uh, and yeah, like a piece of paper is not art. If you make an amazing Andy Warhol's work was not considered art. Yeah, I man. Sometimes I don't know if it seems so important for people that uh, it's art, but I feel like if you're doing something cool, then um, that's it. But then yeah. again, I also see like with all these, you know, profile pictures, the PFPs, and a lot of people say like, "Oh, everything is art." But I think at the moment, it seems NFTs and art are so linked. But I think we should look as an artist from an art perspective, like we create art, I create art, and I can use NFTs as a medium. I can use painting as a medium. Yeah. I can do a performance, but I could also write a book. I can make a music. I can, uh, but I don't believe in being an NFT artist. You, you can be a digital artist. You can be also a conceptual artist who uses the blockchain. You can be, a, I mean, a conceptual theoretical artist. You can be a painter and, for all of these things, you can use NFTs in different yeah. or other forms. And I uh, I don't believe in good because I, I often read that people say like, no, this is good and that's not good. But yeah. I, I think it's way more interesting to now that's all new. Just uh, And Jerry Saltz, he's a, an art critic. He once said like, I want all the artists to earn money, the good ones, the bad ones, and the very bad ones. <laughs> three kinds of artists yeah I, I think our views are very similar um in in that regard uh you know nfts and art have become synonymous almost now uh 
I don't see, you know, I see art as one application of NFTs. Um, and it's the first, one of the first ones, I think. So I agree with you. If I had to define NFTs, I would say NFTs are digital ownership. It's a way to own uh, things digitally. And of course, what's the easiest thing to own digitally? Another digital item. And I think that's why we're seeing these digital items like JPEGs, like digital files, like music files. These are the first because they're the easiest things to attach to a digital token is a digital file. But as time goes on, we will start to tokenize. I believe everything in the world will become tokenized uh, real world assets and indeed property, real estate and everything else. But right now we're in phase one and artists as usual are leading the revolution. Um, so I would like to talk a bit more about Greyman. You're not alone uh, there. I can see that uh, you've been joined by a special guest on your right-hand side. Uh, you want to introduce this uh, important person? Yeah, this is the this is the Greyman. Um, there are many different Greymans, um, and he is actually a figure of mine a character that i used to um yeah work with like in the period when i was involved in house music it's uh, to be very old school this is a book for those that don't know that there's also art on paper um and uh all right so the gray man uh, let's see uh, there is here painting and you see the incredible gray man in i think this was 93 i made a kind of modern day superhero of, uh, of him and he's like fighting against modern plagues of society like fun humor initiative and color and um i don't know like with most of my work i do things for a period when i'm really into it and then i move on and i get obsessed by other stuff um the gray man I used for a few years. And um, then uh, he's, I mean, for a lot of people, he was a kind of iconic figure in my work, but I hardly use him anymore. Still in 2002, I did an installation at Burning Man. That's uh, where this, uh, the paper mache gray man's come from. But um, after I think like 97, 98, I didn't use him anymore. But he was so iconic that when I started doing NFTs and people also saw, you know, like these profile pictures and the crypto punks and so many people asked me like, hey, are you going to do a Grayman NFT? We want Grayman NFTs. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it because this was like my past. And I don't feel any urge to do that because it would feel like a kind of, you know, money grab or. But then um, something uh happened but I, I think what's interesting to show is when we look at profile pictures and there is all these gray men's here like the gray punk gray angel gray so i made all these different gray men's it, it was made for for the pfp uh movement yeah but this is 95 you know? i know ahead of your time right or yeah the gray man was ahead of his time the OG, like the, the, OG. the people that have been doing this for three, four years. Now it's the o, original gray man. But then uh, in the back of my head, I told everyone, look, I'm not going to make a gray man NFT. But I mean, I never say never. Always it's in a moment. And then uh, because of these pixelated pic figures, the, the, the crypto punks, everything, I felt like, hey, I want to. Uh, it's not even thinking. I went like, I'm going to make a pixelated. Grayman, the crypto Grayman. And then uh, that's like a lot of my stuff is, hey, I have this idea. And then, uh, I don't know, the other me has to start dealing with it. And I use the crypto Grayman to, again, play in my kind of data way, I guess, with the NFT space. Yeah. And what I did was, uh, and that's actually where M House also got pretty involved uh, yeah this is super interesting so so break this down for us. So you you have gray man and you're like yeah he's already he's a profile picture he's perfectly suited to this you could have just dropped him in low effort yeah. and made a, a profile picture however because you like to mess with perception and how people view things you instead i made the crypto gray man which is a pixelated gray man so i uh i made a pixel version of him but and this is 
where again things got a bit different i didn't create the pixel version on a computer no i painted the pixelated crypto grayman so uh in order to make a pixelated crypto grayman i first made a painting and then i made nft and i didn't make like 10,000 nfts now i made one um and uh, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very interested in different realities. I felt like, okay, I'm an artist that comes from a physical, like painting background, and I'm always interested in new developments. In reality, I'm venturing out in this new space, which is digital. So I wanted to play with that and also play with the fact that, like, the crypto punks and a lot of NFTs, you know, suddenly they're worth so much money. And but does that what's What's the value of it? And is it really art? Is it more valuable than painting? So I did this experiment where I painted this crypto pixelated gray man. I took a photo, a good one, and I turned it into an NFT. And then I, um, and this is something what I also did when I started a bank, uh, my own bank as an artist. I know that money is like so important in our society. And when you want to, get attention for a topic using money works pretty well. So as with the bank, I built a tree and we glued lots of money on the tree dealing with value. But what I did now was, okay, so there's a painting of the crypto gray man and there's the NFT. And I felt like, okay, I do two auctions. I start them at exactly the same time. One was an auction house, although the auction was online, but led by an auction house. And the other was on a uh, rareable and online platform. And I started the exact same minute and I ended the exact same minute. And I said, like, look, this is a kind of horse race. You know, which one has more value, the NFT or the painting? And eventually the NFT one was bought by uh, one of you. And then what's interesting, the painting was actually also bought by M House, who won so both auctions. So uh, that is very interesting, but also the people that say like, yeah, but you see the NFT is worth more than the painting. The I think people forget that there's just, it sounds simple, but there's so many layers because the painting was made specifically in order to create the NFT. So the NFT ha also has value because the painting was made especially for it. And um, yeah, and uh, I don't know. And then, so this one time cameo appearance of the gray man, I think he, uh, but and, and somehow the gray man also fits, even though I uh, developed the character like 25 years or more ago, I mean, in our society, it's something that's very, what I don't like about society is all these rules and even this thing like you're a good citizen if you wake up early and you go to work and he seems more uh, dominant than ever, the gray man. And I don't know, I started playing with him and... Uh, again, I don't know, there's this, what I said, there's there's just ideas and there's, because there's a new project coming and I, I'm pretty excited about that new project because it also feels very much in the data spirit. It's kind yeah. of, it's a big prank, but at the same time, it's it's a very serious prank because it's a simple idea. It's, people could say it maybe takes the piss out of profile pictures, but it, it, it doesn't in a way, it's just, it's not about being good or bad. It's, yeah. It's going somewhere because what happens? I want to I want to get to that, but just, just you know, just first I want to just you know get 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 back to crypto Grayman just for a moment because I think there were mm -hmm. some really important lessons that I took away from that, and that we all did as well. I mean, it suits it so well, you know. I think CryptoPunks, if you look at them, uh, and CryptoPunks is an amazing project, by the way. I think for for anybody that's kind of new to the space or isn't aware or thinks that CryptoPunks are some kind of low effort um, because they're 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 low quality pixelated. The amount of thought and time and um, coding and mathematics uh, that went into creating uh, this combination of ten thousand CryptoPunks is is actually quite uh, quite impressive. We won't get into it now, but they're they're created from all these different layers that, at the time you minted them, were all pieced together at that moment, um, and each one of them is is, is unique. So. Um, they're they're not low effort, but they're also an homage to that early days of the internet. Um, that probably dates back to a similar time as uh, as as Crypto Grayman. So I think he fits perfectly there. But the other thing that you were playing with was, of course, that you hand painted this 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 pixelated one. Um, and but you were also asking the question, which is worth more? Um, and of course, um, 
in the end, it was the NFT version. I think that um, that sold for a higher price. What I found really interesting is because uh, within M House, we we bought both, and I saw the the two purchases. And and this came as as an eye opener to me as well because it's rare that you see an NFT being sold as an NFT and as a physical piece, or sorry, the same piece being sold as NFT and physical. And the the learning was the person who bought the NFT had it in their wallet within uh, seconds of the auction closing. They immediately had it on their Twitter and had it on their profile as their profile picture, and they had full one hundred percent complete ownership of that piece of art from the moment that that closed uh, and they needed to pay of course for the art uh, and also for the ethereum gas prices the person that purchased the um physical piece of art uh had to pay uh btv or vat in the netherlands they had to pay the um gallery fees of course uh, and then owned a piece of art that was sitting somewhere else and they then had to work out how they would take ownership in the meanwhile it, it was in storage on their behalf, um, then it needed to be uh, packed and shipped, uh, and potentially damaged, and it just really brought up some interesting points. In again, this idea, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, um, but this idea of digital ownership and of immediate ownership and immediate transfer of ownership, uh, and I think that's the power that uh, NFTs give us. And you know, some people like art and are happy to ship it. Uh, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but it was very interesting to see that smile of satisfaction on the owner of the NFT's face, having just that thing in their possession immediately to do what they want. It's very important to realize that physical and digital reality are two, they have two completely different qualities. So everything, it's like if you would buy a house, I mean, if you get a house in a metaverse and somebody, you know, constructs it, you you buy it and you can immediately like move in. And if you have a real physical house and you'll want to decorate it and move in, it can take a really long time. But obviously, it's very different if you live in the digital house or you live in your physical home. And also, I believe that uh, with art, I mean, it's I think it's like with Spotify, you know, you can listen to Spotify, but you can also have music on vinyl. And it's two completely different experiences. And also, even with NFTs, you can have them in on a screen in your home. You can hang them on the wall. But I feel that if we are increasingly spending more and more time on our time on our screens, so that means NFTs and a lot of stuff that we have in the real physical world. We also want to have that in the digital world. But at the same time, the value of for me physical art and paintings will also increase because that becomes more and more special because it's not something that just moves and. It's beautiful that you can have your art everywhere with you if you have an NFT, but that painting that you, because I know uh, collectors of mine that have had work of mine for like 25 years, and they also say like, they will never ever sell it because each day, I know one person, he has a room where he has his art and he has like a few works of mine. Each day he goes in there for 10 minutes, he looks at the art and then he can actually handle his day. And um, the fact that also, a physical artwork is not moving. I think that's also a big quality, and you can see the paint and how it's hanging. So it's it's two different ways. I mean, maybe the word cons I don't like the word consuming for art, but still, if it's two different ways of consuming art, having a physical piece or having a digital piece, and both have advantages and disadvantages. My Burning Man projects. If I would have done a project like Burning Man instead of building a ship. Because I've built a big wooden freemaster, ship it to the United States, burn it in the desert. I mean, building it a ship in the metaverse and then shipping to to another part of the metaverse and burning it there would have been uh, probably way easier. But uh, it would have not ruined my life like with the other project. But I would. It, never... it, it, it hasn't been done yet. I mean, I'm not sure anybody can uh, throw you out of uh, Decentraland or the metaverse or ban you from coming back. Um, yeah. Which I think uh, happened to you at uh, at Burning Man. Is that correct? No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I, I I I've never I've not been banned from Burning Man. No, I mean I uh, I've spent like amazing. Uh, I've done so. I heard a rumor. I, I heard a rumor. People were not happy about you burning thousands of papier mâché graymen. Well, I mean there were uh, people that it's 
I mean, but okay, happy. This is again where opinions, the like for real, the big golden like that uh, 50 feet high like that I built at Burning Man for sure has been one of the most controversial projects they ever had uh, there. But I know Larry Harvey, I mean, he's, he's an amazing guy, the guy who started Burning Man, uh, their, their founder, he died a few years ago. He actually stayed two weeks with us in our home in Amsterdam. Uh, and that guy's amazing. Now, he really loved, and a lot of people loved the project, but then you see uh, there are also these people that go there and they don't come from the background of the prankster culture of this whole what Burning Man is about, and they just see a logo and they say, like, hey, there's a rule that says logos are not allowed. Hmm. And uh, but that's always, I don't know, where uh, no, I, I, it's just for me, I, I, I love Burning Man, but it's it has like with house music, it was, I was for a few years, I was a big part of it, and then, uh, then for also a while, I want didn't want to have anything to do with it because I was going like I want to, I need to escape that, I need to do other things. But also at the moment, uh, I, I'm really proud of the fact that I made record covers when I was like 22 years old, and I felt like hey, they're cool. But in a few weeks, nobody will remember them, and it's 30 years later, and they've become classic, and they're being uh, you know uh, in exhibitions, and people still cherish them. And I just did a, a mural for the House Museum here in Amsterdam, and I'm actually doing, I'm still working a lot, but it's not any, it's not anymore in my life. And I think with Burning Man, it was the same. It's been a huge part of my life. I spent, and I've had a chance to do amazing stuff there. But then I also wanted to move on. So I think for a few years I didn't really feel like. Uh, I think it's like breaking up. You like House Music is my uh, ex-girlfriend. Burning Man is an ex-girlfriend. And now at a certain point, you need to break up and then you start having a new relationship with them. And then you realize you still love them, but it's not like, you know, it's not your girlfriend anymore. No. And then every so often, I guess, you know, you don't see them for a while and you get together and you have a few drinks and uh, who knows what happens, right? <laughs> Which leads us back to Gray Man, you know, maybe one of your exes that was resurrected. So CryptoPunks took these, 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 you know, multiple layers of images and used complex algorithms to generate 10,000 unique um, images from those and gave them some scarcity by saying there's 10,000, 10,000 only, and there'll never be any more. You played with that idea um, by hand painting a pixelated crypto gray man and making only one. Great. Now, I understand that the next evolution of a uh, crypto gray man is again to play with this idea of digital scarcity and to turn that on its head. Tell us about that, because I should also say we're recording this um, before this project is released. It's very hush-hush. So this is going to be released, I think, just after this project. A lot of my projects, especially like the past 10 years, like physical versus digital reality. And I I love painting. I, I mean, I'm opening a new show of paintings in a few days, and uh, it's still my biggest... It, I believe that will be my biggest love forever. And I... I what I love about a painting, and that was also what the Crypto Gray Man was dealing with, that if I make a painting, I mean, I could I could theoretically make a new paint, a new Crypto Gray Man, and it would almost be the same. And if I would put a really huge effort and amount of time in it, it could be like 99% the same, but it would never be really the same. And I think it's totally stupid to try to do something handmade and then create another exact copy because that's not what handmade things are beautiful that they're unique and but in a way the beauty of digital reality is that if i make a crypto gray man digitally then i could make thousands of them i could make tens of thousands i could make hundreds of thousands i could so in a way in the digital world there is abundance there is no scarcity but then i see that especially now, I mean, crypto punks were the OGs in a way, but now everybody and their bored apes. But now you see, like, every week I see a new kind of bored ape that roughly maybe looks a little bit like a bored ape, and there's only 8,000 or 10,000, and they have rare traits. And this characteristic is worth more than, but in a way, it's all artificial, the scarcity is all created artificially. Uh, but again, 
this is not something that there are a lot of layers in this new project, but it's not something that I sat down and I developed a project and I want all these layers. No, what happened that when, and serendipity is what I love serendipity. Uh, so there was this coincidence that when we did our event to launch the crypto gray man, that same evening, there was the first ever Amsterdam NFT meetup, which I only heard about like the same evening because the guy who owns the building where it was held sent me a WhatsApp. He went like, are you also coming? I'm like, no, because I've got my own event. He said like, yeah, but this one is late. Come uh, later. So after launching the Crypto Gray Man, uh, with a few people, we biked to that building. And there, I expected maybe 20 people to be, but there were like 150 people. And uh, a few people had, you know, like a keynote speech and a presentation. And uh, I was listening to the presentations. And then uh, at the third presentation, I suddenly see a WhatsApp. And it says like, hey, Dadara, you're the next speaker. And I went like, what? It's so I, I went on stage. I was not prepared, but I just talked about Crypto Grayman. And then, I don't know, the atmosphere was great. There were a lot of drinks. And uh, then, I don't know, I was talking with someone. And went like, you know, we were talking about also about the PFP projects. And it could become your avatar in the metaverse. But what if the metaverse, everybody could be there then? We would need like billions of uh, avatars, not, you know, like 10,000, 10K projects. And then I, I don't know, it was like two o'clock at night. And I went like, maybe we should just make like, you know, how many people are on this planet? Almost 8 billion. Let's make like 8 billion gray men. It's just one of these ideas, but that's what always happens. It's two o'clock at night. I maybe had a few beers, maybe not, but it's just, I don't know. I'm talking with someone, crazy idea problem i think with me is that when i have it's the same when i had this idea of building a huge ship and shipping it to the states and burning it it was also this idea it just popped in my mind and then i'm going to do it but i went like mm -hmm. hey, this is interesting and then i actually had a zoom chat a few days later uh with actually there was scott the friend of mine that uh, he got me into nfts and a friend of his and i was telling them the idea and they then they said, like, yeah, but this can be done. And um, what I what I like about conceptual ideas as an artist is that when they're kind of, they seem simple, it's the same like the 50 feet high golden light in the desert. But maybe because they're simple, there, there can be a lot of layers. And also people can even discover layers in there that um, maybe I didn't even think of. And... What I like about this crypto grayman, so there is one original crypto grayman, and that one is hand painted. And from the hand painted one, the NFT is made. Mm -hmm. This new crypto grayman is not, even though he might look pretty similar, he's created on the computer. So every pixel is exactly the same. And yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make uh, we're gonna have eventually theoretically like seven billion nine hundred eleven million. I don't know the exact amount. We roughly calculated the amount of people now on this planet. Uh, can so we... you, took, you took a snapshot of the world's population and said, this is the number that we're, we're going with. Yeah. Okay, yeah. nice. And of course, the moment it gets released, there will probably be already like a million more that that, uh, that doesn't matter. Of course, so customer I... support is going to get complaints from from somewhere that they, yeah. they you know, they, they didn't get one. <laughs> but what I... Uh... What I like about that this project is that so every every NFT is exactly the same as the other one, but there's only one thing that's different, and that's their number. So the first one minted actually will be zero, then one, two, uh, and in a way that's uh, also it it also it 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 points to what NFTs are because now people think NFTs are an image, but not in in a way. When you buy an NFT, you have what you buy is a number. Correct me if I'm wrong. And the number then, I mean, points to the blockchain, and there can be a smart contract, and that can again refer to an, an image which is stored on what is it, the interplanetary file? IPFS, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and like I came up recently with um, uh, what what I think is a good explanation for NFTs. I I, I compare them to, you know, you go to a to a concert, to a nightclub, you get a cloakroom ticket. And they all look almost the same. They're the same color and shape, but they all have different numbers and it points to a particular hook. And that's yeah. kind of what the uh, the blockchain is. It's it's you know it gives you a token. It says this is your number, and whatever's hanging there 
is is yours and indeed we have you know it could be a board ape it could be a, a punk and you can't change what's there and you could you can transfer that token that ticket to somebody else but but indeed so um it's a number yeah you you kind of see really that the only unique thing you have is the number because yep. the image is exactly the same as the other person but then uh, especially in uh, like a kind of gray man world where we all uh, you know need to be kind of the same and everything i mean our social security number increasingly is defining who we are so also actually in the real world we're almost becoming a number but and then again and this is it's an experiment so i don't know what's that's what i always feel when i do a conceptual project i put it out in the real world and then probably things will happen which i don't expect or don't know but yeah. It would be also interesting because we're doing this on uh, Matic. Uh, so uh, people can buy one for really cheap because even if you do one really cheap on Ethereum, to you know, you would still the need gas to costs are huge. Yeah. It's in gas fees. And for the environment, I mean, doing 7 billion gray men having an Ethereum, uh, I would feel like a criminal, I guess. But it's, it's interesting to do it on uh, Matic. So they're really cheap. But then I can imagine that the uniqueness that people still feel, you know, there is, they will make scarcity out of it and they'll go like, yeah, everybody has the same one, but I have number four. Yeah. And it would be really interesting if at a certain point, yeah, number, you could still, because obviously they will never sell out. Or, I mean, <laughs> you never know, but I mean, I don't guess 7 billion, 900 million will sell out. So there will always be one available for one Matic. But I can imagine that at a certain point, maybe number four, people will pay like big amounts of money for it. And then it will be clear that they only pay that for the number. Absolutely. I mean, number eight, number 888, number 8,888 will be popular in China, in other other areas where other numbers uh, will be more popular. So fascinating. So, you know, I have a few questions. Um, so you took a snapshot, you looked at the population of the world, you released that many NFTs, you're releasing them on the Polygon Matic chain, which is proof of stake. Uh, it's environmentally friendly. The World Wildlife Federation have released um, NFTs on there. It does not use electricity and proof of work uh, like Bitcoin does or like Ethereum does for the next few months. So that's good. Um, it's cheap to transact there. There aren't so many gas costs, so everybody can buy one. You said they're one Matic each. The current price of Matic is somewhere around $2.30. So it's affordable. Uh, fascinating. So I have a couple of questions. Um, boring, first of all. You know, we're here about art, but technology. How does how does this work? Um, you're minting these as ERC 1155s or ERC 721s. Do you know? I am not the technical guy in this, pro yep. Uh, yep. Uh, this project, but I think it's ERC 7. 21 and the reason mm -hmm. is that i think everyone when you mint one that the Zunic. number it'll be uh, yeah uh, the number the, the the that the first one means number one number two yeah and uh yeah again i i can't really talk but i i no, that makes total sense 1155s are typically exact copies of each other you couldn't really have a different number so uh, there would be uh, 721 the right answer so that makes me ask then because you, you, I, this has been on my mind. You told me about this some time back and it was confidential. We didn't discuss it very much. And I started to wonder, I thought, well, for such a huge mint, how how is Dadara doing this? Um, uh, you've had some technical advice on this, obviously. Where did the technical advice uh, come from? Who did you go to or who's provided that? Well, that's actually what I said. There's um, um, uh, Garrett and he's... Uh... Yeah, he's doing the whole, with his team, he's doing the whole technical part. And um, I had, yeah, it's the coincidence kind of thing that I, yeah. Scott, Scott got me into NFTs. Then I had a chat with Scott and Garrett and Garrett said, we can do that. So, Great. Um, yeah, again, I'm, but it's interesting that this is not using uh, an existing, like, uh, you know, platform because you couldn't do it on Rarible or OpenSea. This, uh, I like the fact that there is a special platform for uh, this project. Yeah, it's a specially built platform. Feel free to, to shill it. So people watching, listening, where do they go to get their Crypto Grayman? CryptoGrayman.com. I mean, by the time people will see this episode, it'll be uh, it'll be live. And yeah, for one Matic, uh, they can uh, get a Crypto Grayman. 
And then uh, what's also cool is that we'll do it. We have a license. And again, I don't know off the top of my head the name, but it's like Creative Commons. So that also means that people can actually, even if all the Graymans are the same, they can customize their Grayman and do with it, you know, whatever they want. Because actually the original um, Grayman project, which was at Burning Man, and these, uh, so we had like 100, 40, I think, paper mache graymans, and they were surrounding an altar. And during the week, people could customize these so they would become uh, less gray. And I, I like that, that people can do with the grayman whatever they want. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it would also be like really hilarious if at a certain point you go on Twitter and just everybody will have the grayman as their profile picture. So, I mean, we could have, uh, you know, this Bitcoin pizza day, you know, the day that somebody bought a pizza and turned out to, you know. Be, yeah, what was it? 10,000 Bitcoin? I think, I, you know, I've honestly, I've forgotten, but I think something like that, some ridiculous amount of money. Um, you know, there is a day for, for, for everything. So we could have a crypto Twitter, Grayman Day, and everybody could have a Grayman profile picture. Yeah. I and for sure, I mean, it, I could uh, get that. it would be it would be possible, even if like at a certain point, seven billion people would be on crypto Twitter. They could still yeah. all uh, all change the profile picture that day to crypto Grayman. Okay, let's let, let's try and make that happen. If we do, you heard it here first. And also, kids, get out there and get your crypto Grayman before they sell out. There's only seven point nine billion. So. Well, that's they are scarce. That, that sentence alone for me is kind of already enough that you go on the website and you see only seven billion nine hundred eight million. This will ever be minted, yeah. and there is a kind of uh, there will be a counter that says how many are left. This is great. I mean, I learned so much from that you playing with the physical versus digital NFT that I didn't expect, and and I think we are going to learn a lot of lessons from. Uh, this 7.9 billion uh, PFP drop that you're doing. I think we're going to learn things that we didn't expect to learn. Um, yeah, so. but also, I don't know. I like playing around. And I, I don't know. The last NFT I released was a not for sale. So I made a kind of animation with all these not for sale. And it's just yep. not for sale. And by now, free Ethereum uh, is the highest bid. But I mean, I will never sell it. But I... and and. I don't know, for me, it's just interesting to do conceptual stuff that will make people think because also be, coming from the art world, when I first entered the NFT space, it was all about shilling and, you know, and I'm going like, okay, but it's if you make an artwork, it's not the most important that it gets sold instantly. Sometimes that happens. I've made work and they instantly became popular, uh, sell, and it happens with, I mean, it happens with art and music. But it can also be a flash in the pen. You know, you it, it has a lot of value the moment it gets released. And a few years later, people go like, meh. Yeah. But but then it's okay because it has value. It, it's like a fire starter, a flash in the pen. Uh, but it can take a long time for some arts to. So the moment it get released, gets released, nothing happens. And then many years later, and sometimes as an artist, it also happened to me, I make art. Nothing happens when I make it and nothing will happen 20 years later, but that's also okay because that means I, as an artist or musician, I needed to go for my development through that phase to get somewhere else. And that the not for sale is also dealing, I don't know, it's just, you know, that's, uh, yeah, why, why uh, is the value of something defined by the fact that it's sold or not? Beauty, value is in the eye of the beholder. I think a lot of people struggle to get their heads around nowadays the valuations of some NFTs. Um, so yeah, it's it's a subjective thing. But I think what you're doing has real substance. Um, you're not for sale. It's fascinating. Your physical versus digital is fascinating. Making you making the transition from um, traditional art. Not that you were ever very traditional, I don't think, but but from uh, art to to NFTs and really doing it in your own way and in your own style, I think is also really interesting. Uh, and I think it's a great example for other artists or other people just uh, looking to to try out new things, Jenny, and in particular, this new medium. CryptoGrayman.com. Go get your one of 7.9 billion. I'm going to get mine. You have an exhibition coming up, uh, I know. Yeah, it'll run till the 19th of February, so in Amsterdam. 
So it's also nice that people can actually see my real physical work as well. Great. Where is that? It's a Koch X Boss. It's a gallery in Amsterdam I work with. Koch X Boss in the Jordan, indeed. And that's uh, that's where you auctioned your uh, physical crypto agreement. Yeah. Same gallery. Excellent. Uh, it's been fascinating, as always. Uh, I can't wait to see the Crypto Grey Man come out, and I can't wait to see what other things you have going on in the future. Do you have any last words to share with our audience of crypto enthusiasts, of artists, of NFT uh, apes? Be true to yourself. Follow your heart. I have no famous last words, but I think, especially in this space where everything is going so fast and People sometimes I read on Twitter, they go like, I didn't sell for two months. I mean, it does just, I mean, focus on what you really want to say as an artist. And yeah, I mean, eventually if it has value, maybe it won't earn you money now. Maybe it'll happen in a few years. Maybe people will not like it. Maybe people will like it. But I think it's most important because there's so much, it seems like also a bit of peer pressure to really stay true to yourself. And and that, I think, in the long term is what really has value. Fantastic. Great words to end with. Dadara, thank you so much for joining us uh, at M House here on this M Talk. Thank you. Okay, cool.